Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Live in Italy magazine. I am delighted today to welcome Mark and Sarah Hayes, who are originally from a small town in England, and they are now living in a small town in the Piemonte region. What is even more exciting is in during this difficult year, they have managed to buy and restore home live permanently in Italy, and then also open a vacation rental for travelers. And that's something that's very exciting this week because we hope that there's going to be a lot of summer travel to Italy. So my name is Lisa Morales. I'm the editor of Live in Italy magazine. We are a lifestyle and travel publication uh, dedicated to all things Italy. So welcome, Mark and Sarah. So glad to have you here. Thanks, Thanks so much. Yeah, we're delighted to be here too. So I'd like to, obviously, if you are, I think first of all, let's talk about usually, we'll get back to your actual vacation rental, but I'd like you to name it first and say where you are because it's got a little bit of an unusual name. <laughs> well, it's called number 18, Casa di Campagna. Uh, it's based in the small frazione of Sanico in Alfionata. It's a town with less than 800 inhabitants. And actually our frazione in Sanico has just about 150 inhabitants. So it, it really is a small part of Italy. Um, and uh, actually we went through a few iterations for the name. It was yes. a really difficult choice actually trying to find something that, you know, meant something to us and resonated with us, but also, mm. um, you know, might have some appeal to people traveling as well and, and paint a picture of what number 18 Casa di Campagna is like. Oh, that's great. So the number 18 is significant because? Well, it, it is actually the house number. Uh-huh. Um, and so we just thought we wanted something that was sort of timeless and, and a bit contemporary and, you know, and didn't, so many, you know, things didn't translate, translate well from English to Italian, you know, it made sense in English and then we translate it and friends would say, oh no, that sounds like a pub or, you know, just don't do it. So we, in the end, we came up with the uh, number 18. I quite like it in Italian, Giotto, but um, in the end, we just decided on the numerals, so. I, and I think that's easy. And we'll make sure that we put it, all the links and everything and how to get a hold of you. Uh, nobody can forget number 18. So so even though it's maybe unusual, you're not going to get lost in because a lot of uh, places, you know, the names are duplicated or it's by the town or by a name. And uh, how can you forget number 18? So very good. So let's let's go backwards a bit. So you explain to us uh, where you are from originally in England and what you were doing there? Sure. Well, I was actually originally born in Liverpool. Mm -hmm. and, um, I was born and raised in the, in the area, went to school in the area. And um, in those days, Liverpool wasn't quite the fantastic city. Well, Liverpool's always been a fantastic city, but it, let's say uh, the opportunities there weren't so fantastic when I was a young kid growing up. And so I was a bit nomadic as a youngster. I traveled around the UK looking for work mainly, but also having some experiences. And I landed in London, um, which was actually quite a safe bet for me because my older brother lived there. Mm -hmm. um, and I started work in a, in a, in a retail store and uh, that kind of formed my career for the next 30 years. Um, and I was really lucky to, to have fallen into that, into that role. I, I wasn't actually looking for something specific, but I think I was just lucky. Mm. And um, that job then formulated my career for the next 35 years, um, working in London and around London. Um, and then also once I kind of, let's say, didn't grow tired of London, but wanted to experience some more things. Um, I lived in, in Essex for a few years, which was absolutely fantastic it was right by the sea um i uh i spent some time in norwich and my job took me to places all over the uk and then in in later life my job took me all over europe um and actually my job took me to to meet sarah um, oh, okay so, so that very lucky uh 
walk-in job in London uh, <laughs> as a 19-year-old as a led to my whole life. <laughs> anyway. Oh, that's um, nice. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And um, it was kind of like, uh, you know, when I met Sarah, it was, uh, well, 15 years ago or something now. It was... Uh, uh, it's kind of that it, that kind of set us on, or definitely set us on our, on the next chapter of our life, which I'm, I'm sure we'll come on to in a bit. But um, mm -hmm. um, and then you you're actually originally from London. Yes, I'm just on the outskirts of London. Um, okay. I was there until I was about 11, 12 years old, and then we moved into a more rural Surrey. Um, and there I had ponies and, you know, loved the countryside and the outdoors and, you know, always wanted to be outdoors. Um, and so I think that's where my love of, uh, of this sort of environment came from. Um, but it's, yeah, it was a, a lovely upbringing and, uh, and it was great when uh, I, I so fell into retail. Right. fashion retail um, and worked for you know some well-known brands in the UK and uh, yeah as I said it was very very lucky I was I kind of um, I actually relocated to live in Spain so uh, when you asked me about the Spanish dogs I can tell you oh okay well, yeah we'll get to that because I think that's a very important part <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so yeah I, I'd, I'd actually um, moved to Spain over a, in sort of, uh, oh, when was it, sort of 2003. Um, and I'd only been there for a few short months when I got a call from an ex-colleague saying, would I come back to London and do some cover for a maternity leave and for different things? And so that's that's when I, I, I was sort of living in Spain, but working in London, so I'd do a commute. Mm -hmm. So 10, 10 days in England and then a weekend back in Spain. Um, wow. And then towards the, I, I decided in the end that I was just enjoying the career so much that i just wanted to stay so I then became permanent for the company and that's that's as I say when I met Mark so oh that's nice that's a lovely story and here you are in Italy so I, I think I think we need to get to that subject next uh, how did it come about the idea well I guess it starts at its roots it probably starts with when I was a, a, a small boy and um, my mum's originally from Messina in, in Sicily but mm -hmm. lived most of her young life in, in Trieste and so um, my annual summer holidays as, as a kid were spent in, in Trieste um, and I, I, when I, I, I thought about it the other week and I think I'd probably been to Trieste almost every year since I was, I don't know, four or five. And I never, ever grew tired of it. Uh, it's an absolutely fantastic city, really beautiful location, um, kind of uh, has always been a bit of a crossroads in, in Europe, um, or at least that part of Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, it became a, a home from home for me. Um, Aside from going there with my mum for holidays, um, I've got an extended family there and always enjoyed going to see those guys and, and, and keeping in touch and kind of embedding that whole Italian lifestyle over the years that, that came along afterwards. And so that's kind of where my passion from Italy really came from. And actually my passion for lots of things. Um, my my mum, I think, still has a photo of me as a young kid stood by this Moda Guzzi in, in uh, the city centre of Trieste. And I, I'm, I'm sure that that's where my passion for motorbikes <laughs> came from, because I think <laughs> since, that, since that day, I've always loved bikes. And since I was 14 years old, I've always had motorbikes uh, right up until today. And uh, the passion must be quite contagious because Sarah caught the bug. Um, oh. We, we had... Um, <laughs> We rode across um, across Europe to Italy uh, one year to see my mum, and Sarah was on the back of my bike. And uh, at the end of the holiday, and you know, biking holidays are it's, it is a real adventure because mm. bikers are kind of like part of a club. Yeah, and you're traveling, especially in the summertime. You meet loads of bikers in in Europe from all over Europe and the world, and you know, you're connecting with people all the time. Right. And uh, I asked Sarah on on the way back, you know what do you think you know because not everyone loves motorbikes and and obviously you're exposed to the heat the rain everything yeah. and she said well i really enjoyed it but i want to i want to ride i want to drive i want to be in control of my own bike 
And um, so Sarah, we got back to the UK. She started taking some lessons, passed her test, and since then has always time. had always had her own bikes. Yeah. So uh, must have been the passion that rubbed off, and mm. and obviously my passion for Italy. Um, it was actually Sarah's first time in Italy. Uh, mm. Shortly after we met, we we went to Trieste. Uh, met my family mm. and um that that passion that i had i think definitely mm. rubbed off and and sarah as, as she said she'd been living in spain for a while um on the side of a uh, of a hill in in um in southern spain it's quite remote but actually even though it was remote most of the people around there were were english mm. And uh, I think her impression of Trieste from all the things I, I told her was it was quite a small town and, um, you know, not yeah. maybe too dissimilar from her experiences in Spain. And of course, when we arrived to this beautiful historic city with an absolutely fantastic uh, seafront, beautiful piazzas and the bustling cultural mm. daily life. I was completely blown away with Trieste. It was yes. just... I, just didn't expect it to be so diverse, so interesting, so historic. Um, and, you know, to have that city and that culture and that cafe kind of lifestyle, then have a wonderful beachfront too. You know, yeah. it's just um, yeah, fantastic. I loved it very much. And it really did. It was like for a first introduction to Italy, for me, that was just amazing. Mm. So that's where the passion for Italy started from. And then um, I guess over the next few years, we talked about, oh, wouldn't it be great one day if, you know, once work's finished and everything, you know, we kind of hang up our, hang up our work coats and go and spend a lot of time in Italy. And then very quickly, that, <laughs> very quickly. that idea became, actually, let's, let's look for houses in Italy. We need, let's, let's just start our new so life. So tell us it? what year that was. Um, so that was eight years ago. Um, okay. It was eight years ago. And um, we spent the first five of those eight years looking for properties whilst we're on holiday. Okay. Um, so it was quite a frenetic, uh, I'd say a holiday is probably the wrong word for it, but uh, we spent the first five years looking for properties during our work time holidays um, and really not having a lot of success. No, not at all, not at all. Um, it, we, we were like lots of people that, you know, when you go on holiday to a great location and you think, wouldn't it be lovely to live here, you know? And then yes. when you're home, you start looking at houses and dreaming and, you know, and so we really did start it in earnest. And, and as Mark said, you know, we were using our, you got five weeks holiday a year from work and at least four of those we'd be spending traveling to Italy, looking at houses. And, and you know, as Mark said, not, not much success, really. It was just, you know, we needed to be boots on the ground. And, uh, and in, at the end of the day, that is what we did. But um, And I think it was, in a lot of ways, it was a good experience because we spent a lot of time here. We visited lots of different regions. We started in Friuli and, mm. and near the area mm -hmm. of Trieste. Yeah. But we also looked in Liguria, uh, Tuscany, ultimately in, in Piemonte. Um, so it really was a good experience to see the different areas and see how the climate is at different times of the year, mm. meet the people. Um, mm -hmm. And at the end of those five years, we were very close to buying a house. In fact, on the, on the day yeah. of signing the lease, uh, the whole thing fell through, not of any um, mm -hmm. um, fault of our own, uh, it was an absolutely terrible it experience. Pulled. It was our one bad experience of the whole process, and it was it was terrible. Yeah. But um, what it did was it gave us the jolt to say, "Come on, let's just make this happen." And at that point, well, not at, at that point exactly, <laughs> but let's say once we got over the heartache of losing the house, yeah. we got yeah. back to the UK and uh, sat down. As, uh, and I think it was I said, "Let's let's do this. Let's let's make the move." Mm. And, it, and in fact, it was a bit of a mixed blessing because whilst we'd been to lots of different areas and lots of lots of different regions, I'd actually got chatting online to some people who had done a very similar thing that we'd done, actually. They were a young couple that lived not too far from us. We were in Wiltshire. They were in Bristol. We were near Marlborough. And um, they were doing a similar thing, pass, like passing ships in the night, commuting. Mm -hmm just, you know, working, working to live, to exist, you know, and it was no fun. And they did a similar thing. Um, and they, they, 
you know, sold up and they moved over. And I'd got chatting to them, and that's really what made us come to Piemonte in the first place. Is uh, you know they they really sold it to us that they'd got this you know Piemontese farmhouse, and and uh, so we thought, well, well, let's why not have a look? And it was very similar actually to um, the countryside in Wiltshire. You know the rolling hills, green right. rolling hills, big open vistas, but nighttime skies are phenomenal because you don't get the light pollution. And so um, when we got here, it, it kind of felt a bit home from home. It was like very familiar to us, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. um, so. And actually, that's a it's a really good point that Sarah makes there because if we'd have made contact with people, let's say earlier in the process, it, it might have helped actually speed things up because we well, actually Sarah contacted these guys and also a couple of more people, yeah. one of whom is now our, one of our neighbors. <laughs> um, and it really helps understand the area, the people um, and what life's really like. Mm -hmm. Because clearly when you come, to, you come to a country like Italy and you, you look at a house and you think, oh, this, this, how easy would it be to turn this into our dream home? Mm -hmm. The our reality of course can be very, can be very different, difficult mm -hmm. and, and very different. And uh, particularly in Italy, because um, it's famous for uh, having lots of administration processes. Yes. Um, That's the so, nice way of putting it. Most people yeah, say the yeah. bureaucratic yeah. process, <laughs> process. Yeah. Yes. Um, and so um, I remember one house we saw, we, we wanted to get some ideas of how, what the reality would be like of turning it from its existing state to, to the type of house we wanted. And uh, we actually had a, a Skype interview with a guy um, who lived in, who lives in Milan, who's an architect. And uh, we were saying, okay, we've, we've talked to somebody in Italy and they've said X, Y, and Z. And, and he said, no, no, no. That's, that's not going to be the case at all. It's going to cost you more. It's going to take longer. Mm -hmm. It's going to eat into your budget. And mm -hmm. uh, we didn't believe it, of no. course, because this guy was shattering our dream. But actually, he was 100% right. And, and, and so making those contacts really helped us make the right choices. Mm. Um, I think if we'd have bought the house that we, we you know, gone through that traumatic experience, I think actually we would have been disappointed because right. having got to know this area more, you realize how, for us, how important it was to have an amazing view. Um, not just for mm -hmm. ourselves, but also for, for guests that come, you know, you want to open the windows and go, wow, and, and be totally yes. blown away. Um, and, uh, and that the house that we saw was a beautiful, that we nearly bought, had a, was a beautiful house, would have worked really well for us in turning it into a lovely uh, vacation rental, but it didn't have it didn't have the views that we have, you know, we're blessed with here. Um, you know, I'm looking out the window now and I can see the mountains and the green rolling mm -hmm. hills. And it's, um, I think it's really important. So if we could go back just a little bit, because um, that, that is a great information, by the way. And, and I really think that views are key and a lot of people are looking for country living. So congratulations to be able to find that. Uh, I, I know just from readers, and I think somebody commented in one of our past you, uh, YouTube videos that people actually have questions when it comes to buying a home. So I just want to go into maybe more um, specific answers. You said how difficult it was to do this while you were on vacation. You needed your feet on the ground because I think a lot of people, especially any of us who are living in the United States, I mean, it's really hard. I mean, you can go online, you can find realtors. And then I've heard that it's best not to use realtors, let's say, who are just catering to an English speaking market, because you're not going to get the kind of price you would if you don't. So tell us, like, I mean, what were you doing in the process when you say boots on the ground when you got to that stage? Because I'm presuming when you were on vacation, you were just kind of looking at for sale signs. Is that it? <laughs> or were you doing research? No, we actually were doing research. I mean, that's kind of part of our DNA from our from our uh, professional background. So we would do a lot of research in the run up to the holiday. Uh, we'd make a, a plan and a tour of, of where we wanted to go and which realtors we would need to meet with. Um, I think you can really, I mean, I think it would be very difficult to, let's say, take a holiday even for three or four weeks and then look to see houses that are for sale. Um, mm -hmm. unless you have local contacts yeah. here, unless you've made those local local contacts on social media of people who have done what you've done. 
Right. And they, they know the local area and they can say, OK, well, this is a great area to, to live in. And actually, I've, I've been past a few properties that are for sale. Um, we, we actually went through a realtor even when we were living here, um, mm -hmm. because sometimes you might see a property for sale, but, but the owner might not be even living in the same uh, county or maybe not even in the same country. Um, and it, it can be quite difficult to get hold of the right person to speak to in order to show you the property within a, a, a short time frame. Mm -hmm. So, and also um, I, I talked about administration or bureaucracy. Um, a lot of houses in Italy um, they, they, that, are, that are perhaps not, to say it's not legal might not be the right phrase, um, but they've maybe had works done in the past that haven't been um, registered at the local commune. And so you might see a house that you like. And uh, if you if you don't go through, I, for me anyway, I would say if you don't go through a professional realtor mm. who can do the necessary background ground checks for you, you, you could find yourself quite a long way down the line only to find out that actually you can't buy the house of your dreams because um, it's, it's not actually you know, register the local community in, in the way that you see it. Right. Um, so that, that can be quite difficult. So, I, I yeah. mean, our experience tells us to use a really good realtor. Um, I think so. Yeah. Knows what they're doing mm -hmm. and understands the processes very well. Mm -hmm. And actually beneficial if they've, um, if they've sold property to international buyers as well, because that carries with it its own set of rules. Yeah, it, it just gives you more confidence. I mean, we have got um, a friend who lives in, in, in the States and um, she came up, she came over, we met her here, um, but mm -hmm. she was introduced, she came over for a couple of weeks. She was introduced to somebody who was selling a house and literally she paid the deposit, bought it that afternoon mm -hmm. and then COVID hit. So she went mm. back to America and she's been doing this whole um, redevelopment of this lovely house completely online with the help of neighbors and friends and you know so I think there's lots of different scenarios that that can work or can all end in tears um, I think but for us it gave us the reassurance to use you know a, a fantastic architect um, a really good um, estate agent and, um, and you know and, and builders that were recommended to us by right. people that we trusted their opinion I think that again is really important. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're also saying that besides using the professional uh, realtor and getting advice, that you were able to use the internet and connect with other people who have gone through this process, English speaking people, I, I'm presuming. Um, I, I don't know, Mark, do you speak Italian? Uh, I can get by in Italian. I, I wouldn't right. say I'm fluent, but I, I can get by in Italian. Mm -hmm. um, but probably anything that has to do with business and legal matters, like you said, you have to count on on a professional. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you've built a kind of a network in the process of doing this of people who had already moved to Italy. Is that right, yeah. Sarah? Yes, exactly. And people are very, um, you know, I think if you're if you're Kind of open and, and inquisitive and and uh, you know we really wanted to listen and hear people's stories um people are so so um generous with their advice and uh, and you know they'll invite you over and they'll show you what they've done we have some friends who have a b and b in um Nizza Monferrato and uh, Julia and Ian they have a lovely lovely little guest house there and uh, they had all their receipts and their bills and how much they paid for everything and they showed us you know the real bolts of of how they went through this process um, and it, it was really useful and in fact they introduced us to the builders who then did our redevelopment for us um, but I think it's important to, to build a network of, um, of, of of not just English speaking but you know it, people with local experience Italians um, we have some great great neighbor, Italian neighbors that pointed us in the right direction for all sorts of things you know utilities who to go to for this and that and and it, I think in England we lived in a very small village tiny tiny village and over the years you get um, you know your go-to of people so if your fridge breaks down where to buy a cooker where to find a good mechanic um, where to find somebody to advise you about the garden and over the years you build up that you know who you're going to call sort of thing um, and when we came here it was a bit 
uh, all of that's gone. Now we're starting from scratch again. So it, it was important to us to be open to people's um, suggestions and advice. And, um, it, you know, it, 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 it was very worthwhile making those. And now they've become firm friends, obviously, that we, uh, we socialise with. So oh, that's it's a, great. It's a careful balance because, um, you know, people that are sharing stuff online, there, there can be a lot of negativity. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. people who bad experiences and so it, it can be I know when we were looking for help online on social media it was kind of easy to get pulled down a little bit by the the the, the stories of let's say things that didn't go well so you kind of have to balance what you're seeing online with your own gut feeling and intuition and, and your own experiences mm -hmm. Um, as well as having that network of people who have built, been through the process. And then together, um, having all of that information, you can it, it really helps guide you in, in the right direction. And, and when I look back, I, I often think, God, we, we were lucky. Yeah. But we also made some good choices as well. To, to, yes, to of course, good choices. You know, the right people. And, and we used our, our intuition and our experiences uh, mm. in order to get to the point where we are at today. Mm. And even... I mean, everybody talks, even the Italians complain about their own bureaucracy and administration, <laughs> of course. Yes. But um, actually, our experiences have been pretty straightforward and very pleasant. All the people I've, well, we've dealt with at various institutions, whether it be importing our car and motorcycles, whether it be registering ourselves as new residents and then, and then changing our residency status due to Brexit, mm. Um, everybody we've met has been super helpful because I'm not 100% fluent and, and absolutely I try to make myself understood the best I can. Um, but people are patient, yeah. polite, helpful um, in a way that sometimes if you're online and, and you're reading other people's experience, it can sometimes be tinged quite negatively. Mm -hmm. And actually that wasn't our experience at all. No, no. Oh, that's great. So, so let's talk first, uh, maybe I think what you should do is tell us about Alfiana Nata and then um, let us know what year you actually moved on the process of getting there, because that there is an interesting story, <laughs> you know, and also getting the dogs there. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about that. First of all, so Alfiana Nata, where is it? What would be like, I mean, anybody can look up and that's what I did today. <laughs> I looked up on a map, you know, on Google, um, but tell us about the surrounding area. Paint a little picture for us. Well, Alfiana Nata is in uh, an area known as Monferrato. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's two areas, there's lower and, and uh, higher Monferrato. The region is really famous for its food um, and drink, food and wine. And, and truffles. And truffles. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, if I was to describe the area around us, it's made up of very gentle rolling hills, mm -hmm. um, always with the mountains in the background, or certainly in the, in the winter and the springtime with mm -hmm. a, a 360 degree view almost of, of the mountains in the background, rolling green hills in the foreground, peppered with vineyards and agriculture. So it's really lush countryside, uh, gentle rolling hills, um, hilltop towns. Um, it's, it's really picture postcard. It, it, to, to my mind anyway, it's picture postcard Italy. I, I, we traveled through Tuscany quite a lot. And I mean, Tuscany is absolutely yeah, beautiful. It, it really is. Mm -hmm. um, this isn't like Tuscany in terms of the landscape. It's 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 noticeably different, but I'd say it's a bit more um, a bit more rural, not quite as polished as Tuscany, and right. that itself actually adds a very nice quality to it. You know, it's to me it's it's real Italy, it's authentic Italy, um, it's local artisans doing what they do, um, mm -hmm. and in the small town of of Alfionata, there's. Uh, you know, our, our neighbour and friend um, runs uh, beekeeping courses for children, teaching on how to keep bees. Um, we have a friend who runs a, a, a dog, actually very high quality dog kennel and, and uh, dog keeping facility. Mm. Um, another who is a beautiful baker and cake maker. You would never know this from driving through Alfiana Nata at all, that there were so many 
people with these little cottage industries. Um, you know, there's there's so many, there's b and there's a, a wonderful relay just opposite us at the bottom of our garden, fantastic relay with a fantastic um, wine cellar. Um, but you would never know driving through that there was all the, we certainly, when we first moved here, we didn't know any of that at all. We didn't realize that it was such a little thriving community. Um, but uh, yeah, it is really interesting and, and interesting how the, all of these people weren't all born and bred here, but have come from other parts of Italy to live in Alfiana Natta and completely change their life. You know, they, they, people who were um, graphic designers or, you know, right. it, it worked for big businesses at a stage in their life, threw everything up and said, we're going to go to the countryside and we're going to do something completely different and slow down, um, you know, and ha live a simpler life. And which is what we're all kind of doing. Absolutely. Yeah, that's amazing. Amazing story, you know, to think that even Italians need to slow down because <laughs> I think a lot of us feel that they have a slower life anyway. Not, I don't mean like, because like, I mean, obviously Milan and Rome, they're big cities, you know, and, oh. and, you know, it's not that I'm saying that. I'm just saying is to think that, someone in Italy is saying, I'm going to move to the countryside, just like you and many other people desire to live. Okay, so, so what year was it that you finally bought and moved? And then tell us a bit about the process, uh, the process. Um, and I know the dogs are a factor in there. I was curious about that. <laughs> I asked that ahead of time. So, so shed some light there. Well, we moved in, uh, well, it was the 22nd of April, 2018, mm -hmm. um, is, is the date we actually moved here. And uh, the decision to move here was three months prior. So uh, once we made that decision, uh, we, we <laughs> wanted to make that change. We had a plan and, uh, and we, we made it happen in, in three short months, which I think shows that pretty much anything can happen in, in, in three wow. months. Time. We quit our jobs. We, we put our house up for rent. Uh, we got rid of loads of furniture. We completely decluttered. Um, we were very lucky with the dogs because they had already come from Spain. They already had right. um, kept passports. So that, that side was easy. Um, but, you know, we, Mark flew to Germany to buy a left-hand drive car and then drove it back. Um, just, and then we had to... Oh, so yes. <laughs> All things I'd never think about. <laughs> yeah. I know, yeah. yeah. So he flew to Germany to buy a left-hand car, left-hand drive car, drove it back to England, um, and then we had to register it as English for about a week before we then brought it to, to Italy. It was just crazy. But anyway, we did all of these things. And uh, we packed up, um, we moved out of our house. We spent one night in a in a, a B and B with the with the dogs all in one room with Mark with his motorbike stacked full of stuff and me with a car stacked full of stuff, and uh, yeah we left on the um, on the twenty first of April and uh, headed straight across. Spent one night in France in a hotel with uh, again in one room with <laughs> with the dogs, um, and then we we landed on the twenty second and it it was funny really. Look, We've had lots of funny, quirky experiences, but this one really stuck with us. It, the build up to coming to Italy, it, those three months had been absolutely frantic, you know, quitting our jobs, working on notice, packing up all of that. And, and the emotional side of it too, you know, we had right. a, a party saying goodbye to our friends and family, yeah. and obviously, you know, le leaving them behind. And, and it was really emotional. So that morning that we set off, you know, it was, it was, it was a bit, and also being separated because Mark was on the bike, I was in the car. Yeah. Um, we'd only stop at petrol stations to talk. And so, um, but when we eventually arrived, we'd, we'd um, secured online a, a super little house in uh, Casanova Don Bosco, uh, which mm. was great, great for us. Um, really good location near Chieri. So it's, um, it's about half an hour outside of Torino, but it's still in the countryside. And um, there was a lady there who, again, was, was fantastic and has now adopted us. And uh, so now we have like an Italian mother too. Um, oh. She, she took, us, uh, took us under her wing for sure. Um, and we stayed with her. We thought it was going to be initially for three months, uh, but that didn't work out at all. The best laid plans. But as we arrived at her place on the 22nd of April, as I say, it was, uh, I re suddenly realised that it would have been my dad's birthday and um, he passed away 27, 28 years ago. But, uh, and it, 
as we drove to the house, the street name was Strada del Papa. And it was a bit like, it gave oh. me goosebumps that it was- mm, Me too, of, as you talk about it. Street of the Father. And it was just, I've got goosebumps now. Actually, just yes, talking me about too. Me too. Yeah, so, um, and so we ended up staying with Eleanor for, uh, for nine months, not three, because we couldn't find a house. We were desperate. We had a very strict criteria of what we wanted. Um, we wanted something rural, something with views. We needed something that wasn't too run down that didn't need a massive amount of work. Um, obviously we had a budget and, um, and so we had a very strict criteria. We wanted to be able to, you know, still get into a city, um, get easy for shops, a hospital, all the, th all the mm -hmm. things yeah. that people want. And, um, and not too isolated and not too close to closed in. So we eventually, we looked at 57 houses in, um, a six month period um all over uh every day we would head off out look at with a list of you know with the state agents and they'd show us four or five houses in a day and and just nothing was ticking the boxes at all um and then we thought by chance um we found this our 57th house perhaps we should have called it number 57 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but um as we arrived we we saw this the nice thing about this house was that it was a family home. Lots of mm -hmm. the places we'd looked at have been completely abandoned um, that hadn't been lived in for many years. But this had been a well-loved family home where they brought up, you know, the, the, their children and grandchildren. And, and to, to visit a house where you actually met the owners um, right. and they talk you through the history of the house, talk to you about how things work, um, was just fantastic. And the fact that they had a white horse in the garden was kind of sold it to me because again, where we lived in Rushall in Wiltshire, um, it's known as the Vale of the White Horse. And uh, oh wow! And, and as a leaving present, our friends had given us, our friends and neighbours had given us a picture of the Pusey Vale with the White Horse in, which now hangs in our kitchen. And um, so it, again, it was one of those goosebump moments. It's like, yeah, could this, is this a sign? Yeah. Um, and whilst it didn't, you took a bit of convincing really to start off with because it didn't. 100% tick all the boxes, but we got to the point that we had to compromise on something um, to, because otherwise we just weren't going to find anything. You know, we've been here for six months. We'd looked at houses every day and it was a bit like, you know, something's got to give. Yeah. And also, you know, we had a list of, let's say, must haves that, that you know, we, we believed were the things we had to have before we would commit to buying a house. But then in your heart, you also have an idea of what this house is going to look like. And the two simply don't match. Mm. The two for us didn't match up. You know, we wanted to be um, within distance of, uh, of a local, uh, of the local bar, let's say the local coffee shop, mm. uh, the local restaurant and local store. But then in my, in my, in my sort of, my mind's eye, I had a picture of this house on a, on a hilltop. So, you know, the two don't, don't really uh, always match up. And so the compromises in the end were, were, were actually, easy much much yeah. more easily palatable than than we originally thought they were going to be and um now we're here um actually the, it was the right choice yeah for sure mm -hmm. it was it just had everything now that you know being here it, it really did unbeknown to us actually meet our criteria much closer than we we thought initially so right mm -hmm. well, so it was I, it, it was just a three a three bedroomed house um as mm -hmm. i said in a family home with quite a big um, a finile, so a big barn um, attached to it. So it's a Piemontese longhouse. Um, okay. So big finile on the side upstairs, um, just above us. They, they had hay and um, that was it, uh, that was thrown down by a hole in the ceiling. Um, there was no access <laughs> the upstairs. And downstairs was um, basically two stables and a, and a garage. Um, and we're sitting in the garage now. Okay, so so we should maybe talk about that a bit. I, I did not realize when we were first talking that you just kind of sold everything and decided to move to Italy and then find the house. So that's very brave. That's very adventurous. 
Uh, but good for you. So let, let's talk about the restoration because I know, and you probably know, um, one thing that is really popular right now. And, and I'm trying to get some information, but again, you know, like you were saying about having like concrete information and the facts and, and knowing is that you probably know a lot of interest is in the one year of homes. People, so there, a lot of people have these dreams of restoring a home. You're, you're saying something different. Uh, which is nice to hear because I think that's the way I would be. I'd want something, obviously most homes, wherever you are in the world, you, you don't mind fixing up a home, but you certainly want it to have a roof and <laughs> structure basically have been lived in. So, so um, tell us a bit about, you know, your, your home and when you started the process. I know that on your website, if people visit, they'll know that you did a lot of it during the pandemic. So um, give us uh, some insight. Well, we started just to, uh, I mean, the, the house had been a home for, for many, many years. And um, the, and actually that, that family is still friends of ours. In fact, uh, Sarah teaches their daughter English now. Um, <laughs> oh. um, so we, we, when, we, when we completed on the house, we spent four weeks decorating, um, kind of doing the, the, the necessary refurbishments that would just make life comfortable. Mm. Uh, you know, having a fast internet connection, painting all the surfaces. Um, and we actually put a new a new kitchen in as well, and that took about four weeks. Um, and then once we settled in, it was well, it was December time by then, um, and so we started formulating ideas of of what we wanted to do with the barn, um, because we'd always had the idea of having a, a vacation home on the property, mm -hmm. um, and that's how um, you know we it would help give us an income, but also right. give us a purpose. Um, we, you know, through our travels in, in life and our experiences in life, you know, we've gathered our own uh, pretty strong ideas around what a nice vacation home should look like, feel like and deliver. Mm. Um, and so we felt really passionately we could create something that would actually have wide appeal mm. um, and would actually be a bit different to maybe what what others were offering in rural Italy. Um, so we started formulating our ideas at the end of 2018. Um, and to fast forward, the work started in May 2019. So mm -hmm. in that time, we recruited uh, an architect, a local architect who lives just down the road. Um, she speaks English, uh, which was one of the must haves for us because right. from a technical perspective and a legal perspective, um, mm -hmm. we we couldn't rely on yeah. <laughs> on um, on not being able to speak the language fluently. Um, Excellent. And um, the house, fortunately, was was all completely in order. All of the plans, etc., they kept all the records, so it was very easy to update them with the local community. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. And the process went went fairly smoothly. Yeah. We went through a number of uh, both local local builders and ones from further afield for our for our quotes. Mm -hmm. Um, and we ended up with this uh, with this uh, 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 building company that had been recommended to us by friends. I, I think that, that it's a good point that you made. And in fact, I've kind of forgotten that point, but it's very key. As I said, we had a budget uh, and it was quite a tight budget that we really needed to, to stick to. And so we saw five builders, um, some local, some from a bit further away, some recommended. Um, and, the, and the difference in the price was 100,000 euros from the bottom quote to the top quote which is massive of absolute, course massive um and so you know we didn't go with the cheapest we didn't go with the most expensive we went with the, the the guy in the middle um which you know thankfully worked out well for us but it's really important to get um good recommend like word of mouth recommendations where you can see their work um mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, and also haggle a bit too, you know, you could, you could question right. prices and, and that kind of thing. It's really important. Oh, that's good to know. That's great advice. So that was the exciting day that, that in, in May mm. uh, when the work started. And um, I, I guess we started from a perspective of just very practical, a very practical point of view of we had a plan, um, we had a budget and we knew what we wanted to do and, and the materials we, we didn't really think about too much, um, I don't think. And um, we were kind of trusting that the builders and the architects working together on the project um, would deliver a, a kind of a standard build. But actually very quickly um, after day one, we got to understand uh, some of the incentives that the Italian government yeah. offer mm. for um, house renovation. 
which I think are absolutely fantastic. They are fantastic. Um, yeah, so and, please uh, get into that because that's one thing that I had mentioned before we actually spoke is that on your website, you talk about your, your green numbers and having a green bill, which I think is, is, uh, is very important. So, so give us some insight. Well, to begin with, uh, we always had an idea that we wanted to grow our own fruit and vegetables, live a more, uh, let's say, a more local life where mm -hmm. all of our goods and produce were either you know, produced here or we, we would buy them locally. And at the same time, we wanted to you know, save rainwater and we wanted to have a, you know, an environmentally, ex environmentally friendly existence. Mm -hmm. um, and Shortly after the build started, I, I started to look into things like heating, like how the heating was going to function and which brands we were going to buy the kit from. And very quickly, by looking online and, and chatting to our, um, to our architect, we realized that there were many incentives for um, refurbishing your property in an environmentally friendly way. So Excellent. as an example, um, on the heating and insulation system, we were originally going to have a, going to have a gas boiler because in, in the UK, you generally had a gas boiler mm. or an oil fire, fire boiler, and that's, and that's how you heated your home. But here, actually, pellet stoves are, are really popular. They pellets. class as being pellet, yeah. Well, like yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen that even some hotels in Italy, that's what they're using. Mm. Yeah. yeah, sustainable. So we looked into it, and um, sure enough, we could say 50% or not say 50%, but we would get 50% in tax incentives um, by investing in, in green energy if we were replacing a, a polluting old system. So by taking the old gas boiler out and replacing it with a, a new um, condensing pellet boiler system and solar panels, um, you qualified for 50 or 65% in tax incentives. Wow, um, that's yeah. huge. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, it's huge. Mm. And so it enabled us to have a much more efficient, uh, energy efficient system, which was much greener and actually much more powerful than let's say just having a, a gas boiler. So th originally we were just gonna have a plant that would heat the barn, the refurbishment. Mm -hmm. Actually our new plant now heats and delivers hot water for the whole property. Um, Excellent. And um, there are, I think there are 10 energy classifications in Italy for, for house, for house uh, energy efficiency and ours was number nine like the ninth <laughs> worst um and now we have the best um, oh that's excellent congratulations yeah it's absolutely phenomenal um and so after we looked at the heating systems we started to look at the heat the insulation materials mm. and how we would insulate the house um and again we we found out that by using um you know the most modern up-to-date uh, insulation uh, systems on the outside of your property, which, to be fair, we'd never even heard of insulating no. your property on the outside. Like putting a coat on your house is amazing. They call it a capotto, and um, they basically have these. Uh, it's a poly polystyrene bricks, um, or they look like polystyrene bricks that they attach to the outside of your house, and then they put a mesh over the top, and then they plaster over the top of that. So it is literally like coating your house. Um, but it, it made such a massive difference. It, it was quite incredible. And again, it's all incentivized by the government. Wow, that's amazing. I will read yeah. into that. Definitely. Wow, that's great. That's and, good. Uh, and, and there are many more. I mean, for, the, for, your, um, for, your, for your readers, there are many more uh, green incentives in Italy for refurbishing your property, both in terms of uh, roof insulation, windows, heating systems, the capotto, um, even redecorating the outside of your house can be incentivized by the government. Um, of course, there are there are rules that have to be abided by, and uh, and everything has to be up board as you'd expect. Mm. But even for repainting the outside of your house, can can give you like up to ninety percent in tax incentives. Uh, so it's really incredible, and we were absolutely amazed. And and as I say, it kind of afforded us to have a much better more efficient heating system than we probably would have started with it but it really does pay to investigate um you know what what the options are and and not to be put off by uh, um the, the paperwork involved or the or the process seeming complicated if you've got the right advice and the right people talking you through it um you know it, it, it's definitely worth persevering with 
So again, this was a lot of your research. This wasn't just something that, you know, your architect or your builder advised you to do. No, no, absolutely. <laughs> In fact, I wish they had. Yeah. <laughs> there seems to be a kind of... That would have been easier, right? Yeah, yeah. for sure. There, de- there seems to be a kind of a deep-seated mistrust of anything that seems too good to be true. Um, and so when we wow. initially spoke to people, they would be, oh, well, there's bound to be a catch. You know, there's bound to be a catch. There'll be something that means you don't qualify for it. Um, but actually, as long as everything is as it should be and everything and, and the house is what, what they call regular, as in everything's in order, um, we qualified for it. And um, and many more people probably should and could if their builders inform them of it. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't until as I said, we sort of found it online, talked to our architect, talked to the uh, the plumber and electrician mm. who kind of said, well, yeah, if you want to go down that road, you, know, you should have a look at these. And, and that's how we ended up where we are. And we're, we're so glad we did because not, well, not just for the, for the incentives, but actually it's made such a difference to our daily life. <laughs> it's so much warmer. <laughs> <laughs> like in the wintertime, it can be up to minus 15 degrees here. And so oh, yes. even with a, a good heating system, you need really effective house insulation yeah. and as soon as it went on you could notice it like life like 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 uh, night and day yeah mm-hmm. that's amazing so you re- you said that you also then restored the barn which i guess is now your your vacation rental flat yes so tell us a bit about that that and what people can expect uh when visiting Okay, well, uh, as Mark alluded to, you know, we we travelled quite a lot, and uh, we've been to Miami a couple of times too. And uh, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so let me know the next time you're in this area. Yeah, we we, we loved it, and in fact, one of our favourite hotels was was in Miami that we absolutely fell in love with. But uh, so we travelled a lot, and we we knew what we wanted to deliver really to to really delight and wow people that came. Um, and so we wanted. Um, to be a bit different, uh, we found that there was a gap in the market for um, slightly bigger houses that were totally independent. So whilst we live next door, our house, mm-hmm. the, this house has a completely separate entrance. Um, it has a third of an acre completely secluded garden. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's set up high, um, so uh, the views are stunning. You wake up in the master bedroom to the sites of Mon Rosa and Mon Viso. Um, uh, it's we managed to do three double bedrooms with three ensuite bathrooms um and downstairs is all open plan um so it's really a sociable place for people to entertain and so groups of, of friends and family it sleeps eight um so groups of, of friends and, and and you know dual families can come and have a, a great you know three or four days or two or three weeks we've got people from the states coming in september for three weeks um, so it's a great place and, and it is completely independent. There's outside dining, different different areas of the garden where they can sit. We have a pool, uh, which was a last minute thought that we didn't have put in until uh, September. We, were, we, we sort of held back thinking, can we really afford to put this pool in? And and but it, I think it just makes such a difference to people on holiday. It does get hot here in the summer and oh, to have yeah. a pool. Um, is a real must so we again we tried to be more uh, eco-conscious with the pool um, that we had it more neutral looking so it's not you know a big sort of turquoise rectangle it, it fits in with the environment more um, uh, we had a saltwater system so it's not chlorinated um, so it's better for the environment better for your skin and you know uh, that's excellent so that was, that's what we did in in September that was our final big project really wasn't it yeah um and it was was actually one of the benefits that lockdown brought at that that period in time because i guess it was a period when everyone had to take a breath and and look at their lives and evaluate what they were going to do during lockdown Mm -hmm. and and and, you know what to, to do next maybe and for us it gave us the opportunity to reflect on what we wanted to maybe do next over the next five to 20 years. And, and we just, the decision to invest more in, in the rental property was really a decision to stay here for longer. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. we, our real plan was to maybe stay in this area for 10 years before looking to move somewhere else in Italy, maybe start making mm-hmm. our way back along to Trieste. 
Um, but we love it here so much that we, we just, it was quite an easy decision to say, actually, we could stay here for the next 20 to 25 years. Mm. Uh, and so that gave us the confidence to then invest some more into the, into the property. Um, and we're so glad that we did. Yeah, yeah, we are. I'm, I'm yes. really happy with how it's turned out, even though we had the build happening through uh, the pandemic. <laughs> it, uh, the, the builders were off site a fair bit, but not as much as you would think. They still managed to come to work. Um, I think we lost them for about three months in total from that when they started in the May. Um, obviously, they worked through that year until the March and then the pandemic hit and then we lost them for a few months but um and then they came and, and they carried on working in a, in a safe way you know they were they were very conscious of the fact that you know they they were traveling from outside of our area and coming in and do, doing the work so but they absolutely cracked on with it and they worked really hard they'd arrive at eight o'clock uh, six days a week uh, they, they would go off site about seven o'clock in the evening. They literally stopped for half an hour for lunch. They were incredible. You were talking about in this year, the process, um, how it's been restoring the barn and making a vacation home for others in the way that you think that would be desirable. Uh, so I think it's on your website or through our communications that you were talking about uh, the DIY. So I know, Mark, you've learned to do a lot. And Sarah, you're kind of working on your garden. So let us know because like this is, this has been a, all part of the process of learning, right? In this time that we've had a pause mm -hmm. uh, in life. Totally, totally. And, um, you know, well, back in the, U when we had our professional lives in the UK, I think it's fair to say we did well, I did very little DIY at home. We had such a small garden and Sarah mm -hmm. worked it, you know, really hard, but it, it, it was so small. Um, but here um, we, we started to experiment doing our own things because we knew we had to. Yeah. Um, you, you can't pay somebody to do all of the little things. And, and those little things started to grow into bigger things and just became so rewarding. I mean, I was just in the garden the day before yesterday, Sarah was, was teaching. And uh, just, I know from watching over Sarah's shoulder when she's watching gardening programs, um, <laughs> you know, a lot of people talk about, you know, putting your hands in the earth and, and, and getting that kind of engagement with, with nature and, uh, and the earth around you. And it's, it's actually true. I mean, I, I planted these 10 tomato plants and it was such a really good, nice experience doing it. You know, I felt so good afterwards. Um, just thinking about the plants and, and what we'd have to do over the coming weeks and months to get them to where they need to be. And it was kind of the same with the DIY as well. Um, you know, starting off small, um, but then, you know, putting up things like uh, mosquito nets, curtains, blinds, uh, doing the decorating, doing any maintenance works. Um, renovating doing, things. Renovating things, absolutely. Um, renovating some of the doors that you that people can see on the website. It was mm. such a rewarding experience. Mm. I mean, forget about the, the practical side of things, but just it just makes you feel good. Yeah. Um, and it's and it really feels, you know, we're so proud of the of the house because and we can't wait to show it to people. We are so super excited mm. to have people actually come and enjoy it. Um, we had friends over yesterday and, and we ate in the barn just so that we could experience it before we have guests. You know, we ate on the patio. Right. Um, okay. Yeah, and it, because everything's just so different at this end of the house, it's so completely different to our end of the house. You know, this is very modern and whereas our house is very traditional and very, you know, quite old and we haven't renovated it. So, um, mm -hmm. so being in this part of the house is a real pleasure, but we're so proud of it because it's done with real, you know, thought and love and consideration so we're, we're super excited to be able to share it as of next week <laughs> that's great yeah we'll talk about that in a minute so I know that you also mentioned I mean the gardening so you are now preserving right yeah, yeah and absolutely. that was an accident wasn't it <laughs> <laughs> well we inherited the, this huge garden for us it's it, it's like having your own park uh when we first wow. moved in we'd walk out in the i mean it's only an acre but when you consider what we had at home which was like a postage stamp of a garden um with lovely views but it was very small um to this you know we'd wake up in the morning and walk out in the garden with our coffee and and, and be like kids like 
well, what are we going to do with it? What do we do? You know, so we've got um, we've got two massive fig trees. We've got two, three, four cherry trees. We've got apples, pears, peaches, plums prunes or oh, everything um and we were really blessed as well because the people that the family that had lived here for over 20 years had planted um the garden although they had they grazed a horse in the garden which was their lawnmower um we don't have that luxury i am now the lawnmoweress um that uh, they they did some lovely planting so we've got some really lovely well established established trees and, and plants um but it was a learning curve you know that, thank goodness for the internet because i yes I, you know, I look at how to prune, well, Mark does the pruning of the trees, but, you know, how to care for these things so that we didn't, we really felt that we were uh, like custodians of it, you know, and I just didn't want to kill anything. So, you know, I, I researched how to look after these things and uh, and now it's, uh, yeah, beautiful, lovely. And, every, and everything's a surprise every, every day, or, and even yearly, different plants come up that you think, that wasn't there last year how has that happened Joe? how have we got this now um and it's amazing I'm forever taking photographs I don't have a big enough memory on my phone for these for photographs of the of the place but um and the allotment we inherited the allotment too which um had been left to go to to seed really because they were very busy with selling the house and and, mm -hmm. and this was a big place for them to decant after 20 years of family life so um uh, yeah, again, we started, all, we made all new beds in the allotment and started to grow our own, own things. And uh, yeah, I started to make, I introduced um, fig chutney to the Alfiana Nata community. And uh, we, we took it to a neighbour's one day for, when we went for lunch. It's, you know, traditional to take something that you yeah, uh, it's you nice. made. And uh, so I took a, a jar of this fig chutney. And lo and behold, the next day we had somebody stop at the gate. We were sitting outside having a cup of tea and somebody stopped at the gate and they said, oh, you, you sell chutney. I was like, what? <laughs> no, we don't sell chutney. But, but my, my friend has said that she's had this chutney and it's amazing. Can I buy some? So we said, no, please have some, have some. So, and then the next day she came around with some chocolates for us to say thank yeah. you. And it goes on. So yeah, it's good fun. That's really nice. And I think you mentioned that you have a vineyard next door. They're growing Nebbiolo. Mm, yes, we do. <laughs> yeah, and actually the vineyards in the area are growing every year. At least I think yes. it's not my imagination, but it was a very, it was quite a small vineyard only three years ago, but mm -hmm. I, I think mm -hmm. it's doubled in size now. And I, I think that um, the, the, the part of Monferrato that's below Asti is, is mm -hmm. slightly hillier and traditionally that's where um, most of the vineyards have been, but I think now that the, the local vineyards and the local wines around here, people are starting to appreciate more, mm. and the um, the local um, artisans and, and farmers are starting to realise the value of it. So the vineyards are actually growing. The vineyard that was at the bottom of our garden now extends beyond our garden, and um, it used to belong to the house originally a long time yeah. ago. It, it, on old plans that we found, it did actually. Right to the house but they, over the years they sell it off because they don't want the the work of it so, um, so and, it, then, and then at the south face sorry the west facing garden there's a there's a peach tree which belong i'm uh, sorry a peach farm which belongs to our neighbors hmm. um and they are i mean we've actually learned a lot from those guys because yeah. they've got uh the, the peach tree farm and then in their own backyard they have well cherry trees yeah. uh, pear trees um, and so we're always looking for tips. If, they're, they if they're doing something, we're thinking, should, should we be doing that now? Is that is that a process we should be following right now, that treatment? Um, and, and they're lovely, aren't yeah. they? They're really, in fact, everybody's been been so kind and so nice on our on our particular journey here anyway. Yeah, we've been very, um, very welcomed. We did worry when we first came that we would feel lonely um, mm -hmm. because we've got a nice, you know, well, fantastic network of friends, a small network of friends in England because when you're working so much, you just, you don't have time to build those. But we had some great friends in England and um, and we, we, you know, miss them a lot, but we, we speak on, you know, social media. And, uh, but uh, yes. when we came here, People were so welcoming. They would stop by the gate and say, welcome us, you know, just hello, why did you come? You know, this is amazing. <laughs> uh, we're the only English people here, which uh, so we're quite a novelty. Um, uh, we found, you know, there, there, I think there's two or three Italians that um, here that speak English, um, mm -hmm. which, you know, it's great we socialise with those guys. Um, so we, we've got a really nice network of friends now. And I think because we've got more time, 
to make those build those relationships you know it's another thing that you realize when you when you slow down and take a take a yeah. breath yeah. you can really you know connect make those with, connections yeah mm. that's beautiful that is so nice so as you know uh, this talk has been called chat with an expat and in uh, today's in today's circumstance chat with two expats so i'd like to ask this is a something because it's funny the the term expat has evolved uh, through each interview so i'd like to ask you that question uh, what is your personal no it's true of you so you might have different answers what is your personal definition of an expat um well i think what I'd like to think of for, 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 well, for me, if not for us, is for is that somebody who's really embeds themselves in the in the way of life of, of whatever that person has moved to. Mm -hmm. um, there are so many communities, um, both in Italy and abroad, and I, I guess the Spanish, the, mm. your experience of Spain is probably true of that, where there are you know lots of groups of, of expats. And for us, it, and definitely for me, it was something we wanted to avoid. We wanted to be part of the real Italy and embracing everything that that brought with it, both, both the challenges and the opportunities, mm. because mm -hmm. if we weren't fluent, fluent in Italian, would have been much easier to have moved to a community where there were lots of English speaking people. Yes, of course. Um, but actually, we wanted to live in the real Italy and, and in our dream home and our dream uh, vacation home that people would want to spend time in the real Italy. Yeah. You know, if you were, if you were clearly, if, if you want to go to the most famous places in Italy or famous places in the world, that's what you're going to, that's what you're going to want. But we wanted somewhere where people could experience the, the real, the real Italy, yeah. the real mm -hmm. small living in Italy and all of the beauty that that has to offer. And we wanted to live in that environment. We wanted that to be our daily life. Mm. Um, and so, you know, meeting local Italians, being friends with local Italians, trying to build the relationships even through the language barrier. Um, mm -hmm. And even if it meant working through what, what we thought would be quite a lonely existence to begin with, whilst we built relationships, whilst we developed our language skills, you know, we were happy to accept all of those challenges, happy to accept the challenges we would face from an administration point of view to, to, you know, to have a, a proper legal life here as residents. Mm -hmm. um, we were happy to do all of that, but in the end, those challenges just didn't exist. People mm. were fantastic, mm. so welcoming, so kind. Even in small Alfie and Anatta, there are English, spe <laughs> English speaking Italians um, and, and people in, in, the, um, in the administrative offices and the comune and the questuras have been super helpful mm. that all of those fears we had really never, never came to fruition. Mm. Um, I think it's interesting that having lived in Spain for, for a, a relatively short time whilst working in London and commuting over those five years, you know, I do like seven months, nine months, three months commuting. Uh, it was very different there because I lived in, um, although it was on, on a hillside in the middle of nowhere, um, it, I was surrounded by um, expats, all English speaking. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it really didn't um, give you, I, I could have been anywhere. I did, you know, it, yeah. I could really could have been anywhere. Um, and so to come here and be totally immersed in Italian rural life is, um, is, a, is a world apart. And uh, I think some coming to a small village like this and even the people that moved here to slow down, to have a simpler life, they come, mm -hmm. they've come from Rome, um, they've come from Torino, they've come from Milano, and they feel as much of an expat as we do, even though they're- That's interesting. Yeah, even though they're Italian, coming to, to Piemonte, um, you know, for, say, for example, from Rome, they, they feel, in the beginning, they felt a bit outside, you know, coming into this community. So uh, it, it's, it's, um, an interesting thing that those people have all merged together in little Alfie and Anatta. 
That's beautiful. I love that. Yeah. And, and to think like, again, you know, an Italian feeling like an expat that, that moving away. I mean, I think this is part of us as human beings, you know, and you know, we, we evolve in life. And like you said, there is a, a great need to slow down and start to uh, understand what your priorities are. So that's great. Uh, so um, also is, is there anything that you miss from home or can you pinpoint that? <laughs> um, no, you know, when I first moved over, I really thought I was gonna miss uh, the thing, the convenient things, you know, like home delivery shopping, um, you know, just, just things made easy. Um, mm -hmm. But that's part of the pleasure now that I've got the time that, you know, I could shop daily. Uh, you know, food shop, <laughs> food shop daily and cook, cook fresh or, or you know, that those type of things. So I don't really miss any, anything. Um, you know, I miss seeing my friends on a regular basis, but, you know, my, my old friends I, on a regular basis. But even now they, they've been out, uh, obviously, before the pandemic. Uh, we were lucky enough to have lots of visitors uh, to come and see and stay. And, and they, we have better quality time with them because they're on holiday. We've got time. You know, we haven't got to worry about work the next day. So we have better relationships with our friends from England, even um, through living here. And they've got a bolt hole in Italy now, which they really like. <laughs> I think all of the, the smaller things, let's say, like Cadbury's cream eggs, Yes, <laughs> I have consent. <laughs> oh, well, hold on. <laughs> we can get, because my, my mother uh, was born in Birmingham. Oh. And uh, yeah, and I, I was born in Canada. She went from there. And it's funny that you say Cadbury's because whenever we would go to England or she would go, we would always make sure that we got, because it is not the same, you know, no. in North America, Cadbury's. You've got to <laughs> get, <laughs> and cream eggs is my number one. <laughs> <laughs> kindred spirit <laughs> yeah no it, it has to be and I, I like I said oh wow that's anyway sorry that was a distraction so no, you miss I, Cadbury cream eggs <laughs> our, our friends now send over these little kind of um first aid packs of Cadbury's cream eggs uh and um galaxy chocolate mm. and uh these and is it roses because i remember it used to be a box was it called roses or something yeah, roses yeah. and quality street quality yeah street. <laughs> yeah exactly um but it's amazing now what you can it, you know learn to do you know learn to make shortbread biscuits and um scotch eggs i made once when we had a picnic you know who knew that you could actually make a scotch egg and not just buy it but research it you can do anything <laughs> uh, we lived very close to most of my family when we were in the UK, didn't yeah. we? So my mum, my, my sister, my brother was only an hour away. So we, we really, my brother and his wife were just an hour away. So we really miss them, don't we? Yeah. Because yeah. we used to see my mum, my sister, well, most weekends, if not every other weekend, mm. my brother every now and again. And my brother. Mm. And your brother, of course, and, and his wife and their family. And so that's that's probably the biggest wretch, I would say, that not mm. being able to see them. Mm. And, um, and also, obviously, because of COVID, you know, we haven't seen anybody. I'm, I've not been back to the UK since yes. we moved three years ago. So, um, you know, we, we it will be great when we can see those yeah. guys again. But yeah. they will have plans to hopefully when um, everybody can get their COVID passports and they can come and, come and see yeah, us. Yeah, the visit. I'm, I'm sure, you know, it, it won't be much to say <laughs> to go visit because you have such a desirable location. So um, we're going to wrap it up then. It was great talking to you. I think a couple of lessons learned. I mean, you know, what you've learned through the process, it was a very inspiring story. And I think, you know, the the lesson of, of doing your own research and using the internet and you can just just do anything you want to do. So tell us then, um, nice and clear, your website, your social media handles, um, you know, any kind of logistics about, you know, renting the vacation home and availability. I know you're booked next week, right? <laughs> yeah. We sure are. So the website is www.number18.it. Um, we're actually pretty fully booked for this season, but only two weeks of, of next year uh, are booked up so far. So for next year, it's it's almost completely open. Um, you can also find us on Airbnb. Um, okay. Yeah, we're on Airbnb. Uh, so you can find us there if you search for properties in Sanico. 
Um, we, you'll see us stand out a mile because uh, lots of the properties around here, there are, there are bed and breakfast or vacation homes are quite traditional Italian and, and we're a bit more uh, contemporary. So you'll easily recognize our home. Okay, and you're also on Instagram. What's the handle? Um, on Instagram, we are number 18. And mm -hmm. on um, uh, Facebook, we again, we are at number 18. So, okay. And so we'll be sure to put all those links and then also for your Airbnb link as well, you can send that to me. Uh, so anyway, so I will just uh, say that we are Live in Italy magazine and it's www.liveinitalymag.com and at Live in Italy mag, easy, not as easy as number 18, <laughs> but still easy to find us. I just want to say how delightful. I'm so glad that we connected and we did connect on Instagram and you have just reiterated how important it is to make connections that way. So I'm glad to have met you and wish you the very best. And uh, if you've been following me, you know how much I love wine. So <laughs> when I get to Piemonte, <laughs> I will stop no. by and visit and see no, no. And, and try some uh, fig chutney. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and I'll save you a Capri's cream egg. How's that? Wonderful. I would love that. Okay. So thank you. And uh, I hope to connect with you again soon. That would be great. Thanks, Thanks so Lisa. much. Bye, Bye everyone. Time.